Mike Bender again with uh, Model T Tips. Uh, I'm in uh, Chelsea, Oklahoma with uh, Claude Jockman. And this morning, Claude's going to show us how he rebuilds field coils. Uh, I might point out that uh, Claude isn't in the business of you're doing not a business, period, in the report. But uh, Claude's contact information will be, on, will be available to you guys. And if you have any questions or concerns, you can, uh, he'll be more than happy to answer questions to try to help a guy through. And he's going to uh, spend some time here and take us through the steps on how to rebuild field coils. So, Claude, I can turn it over to you. Okay. What we're going to do today is just run through the process that I use to rebuild these magneto field coils, but I'm going to give credit to Steve Silk that printed the article in the Model T Ford Club book on the um, electrical system for the T. Uh, everything I'm doing today, you can reference it out of this book, and I suggest you get the book because re because reading it is going to make what I do sense. So, credit where it's due. When, when I get one of these in, they're either going to look like this, having been soaked in oil, or you're going to have one that's been out for 50 years, and all the tape is off of it, you're going to have the pair of coils. So, depending on how you get them, how, how they have to be cleaned. Mostly, I will take a sandblaster outside and I will blast these clean. Then when I remove the coils, I have to go back and sandblast what is underneath and sandblast the back side of the coils. Sometimes you can soak them in ga gasoline overnight outside and it will remove all of the oil. But when I begin on these, what you have to do is you have to snip all the connections on these things. Um, there's a tool that I use to remove them. There's probably other tools that'll work, but this is the best tool I can recommend. It's called the beehive tool. It's what it's what you use to open up a beehive. But for what we have to do with these, it'll work for taking them apart and in the process of doing the coils, it will be used there too. So what we do is get, uh, get underneath them. And you can pop them off like this. Essentially, that's what you do all the way around it. You'll have your coils like this. Like I said, you can sandblast these. It'll blast off all the tape off each side. It'll still look dark, but that'll take care of it when we clean them up here. So you get all, you get all your coils off, clean the base of it. Once we get the base cleaned up, sandblasted, put a light coat of primer on it so that it just doesn't rust, that's all. Once it's in the engine, it doesn't matter. One thing you have to check for is the magneto pickup point. Some of them will be damaged, cracked. Some of them will be gone. <clears throat> the rivet that holds it in there has a head on the back side. You can grind off the head, drive out the rivet. The existing hole is the right size for a 1032 tap. You can tap the hole out. I use 3 8 phenolic to make a new wedge. These wedges are an inch on each side, just a triangle with an inch on each side. You'll have to drill a hole through it 
and countersink the hole for the head of the bolt. Because whatever you put here has to be below the height of the pole face. <clears throat> Once you make the wedge, you can install it. You can drill a hole through this side here. That is a 632 hole. And usually the pickup button will be stuck onto the old coil. You can unsolder it, use it again in here. If not, you can use a washer. Uh, any washer will work on that because you're using a flathead screw to attach it. I would countersink that washer so that the screw head will be flush. Okay. I would not install that until we get the coils on it. And the reason being, it being a wedge, you could install it too far inside and it, and it would not let you put the coils on it. So I would put the coils on here first, and then we'll put the wedge in position, mark it from the bottom with a hole, and then you can put the hole in it. You've prepped your base, so the next thing we have to do is clean coils. Okay. What we have here are the coils that we have cleaned. They still look bad, but this is how they are when they're clean. What we'll do is we'll start with one on the ends of it that have been crimped. They will have to be straightened. And I'll clean both ends of it up here. Okay. We run, we run down, this board is 11 and a half feet long. Most of the coils are about that long. Um, I have used wood in the past. A wire brush will tend to dig into the sides of the wood and in time it won't be flat. So I suggest if you're going to do quite a few of these, put a metal piece on top. I've got a piece of inch and a quarter by one quarter on top, top of this. Uh, but what you'll want to do is you will clamp end of the coil here. I just use a pair of pliers to stick inside and just let it unroll. It needs to be tight and where we'll put the clamp we'll, we'll, we'll just clean it. I suggest a reversible drill when you do this because these wire brushes wear and after two or three passes you can reverse it and it will and it will reset the brush to where it works. We'll turn it over to do the opposite side. Okay, once we have it cleaned, if you can observe, there are some areas in it where it has been da damaged. You just take 
I blow with a hammer to make it flat. Run your finger down it and make sure it's flat. Okay. Clean off any of the dust that is on it. Now, in this particular case, I said these are 11 and a half feet long. With all the coils I've done, I know they should come up to about here. It's obvious this one here is short. For either it's one that was done before in the past, or for some reason, since it was new, it was short. So I will make note of that, and I will add a piece to it when I put it on. That way they all have the same number of turns. And by doing it this way, they can, they can vary six inches, it's not going to hurt a thing. But when I see it's off this far, I will make an adjustment. Okay, at this point, after you, we take the one quarter inch tape that we use to put on it to insulate it from itself. This tape cannot be bought in a commercial retail uh, because they don't they don't cut it this thick. You have to buy the tape from a supplier that will cut it off of a roll. The tape is essentially the same tape that Steve Silk has in his book. It's a 3M product. He calls it a 360 tape. It's a glass tape. It's uh, rated, I believe, at 600 degrees. But in, in any case, the original tape that was used didn't even have a glue on it. And it was just a paper that they had on it. Okay, when we get up here, we're going to cut, we're going to roll these left and right. Usually I'll do eight of them left, eight of them right. What we start with, we'll unclamp it down here. We'll unclamp it here. We need to bend a tab about an inch and a half towards you. Reach under here at a 45 degree angle and bend it back. Now, it's important the tape side is going to go against the mandrel. There's a reason for that and I'll explain it when we start to wrap these things. What you want to do is bring this over Put it in the middle of the ma mandrel. Roll it over here. Give yourself about a turn and a half. Let you know it's tight. This is important. Use a rag, a glove, or something to hold this ribbon tight. This copper will cut into you very easily, and it doesn't heal well at all. But with a rag, you can hold it in there. Okay, this again is where the you can tool here. Your beehive tool works best. Because you can come in the side of this thing with a bevel and you can get your coil off. Hold it tight. Usually have a piece of this cut about two, two inches long. And this is just to hold it tight for now. Okay. 
And if you'll see, with your tab up, this is rolled to the left. Okay. We'll roll one more. We'll do it to, to the right. We cut off any excess here that has been bent up. See, this one came up to here, whereas the one we had there came up to here. That's why we're going to add a piece to that one. Sometimes you'll have to re-tighten it. As you do this, it will heat up the copper and the copper will stretch. And then flip it. Your device here, mm -hmm. uh, you've got it all made out of metal. Could that, uh, for a fellow that was just going to do one, is there another way to do that rather than being this fussy? You can make a disc out of wood, piece of plywood. You could make your mandrel out of wood. It just has to be the same size as the core. Okay. That's all. Okay. Um, and just have a way to attach it in there where you can turn it. Um, I had made this for myself because I had two T's to do, and once I had the two, I thought, well, might as well make one for somebody else. <laughs> and then I met my, and then I met Mike Bender. <laughs> Kind of one of these deals like careful what you wish for. <laughs> this one we're going to wind to the right. Okay. So what is different about this one is we've got the tape up. What we're going to do is we're going to roll the tape over and we're going to make the tab come to the front again at a 45 degree angle. And instead of going on the bottom, again, we're going to keep the tape against the mandrel. So just place it on top, right in the middle, and we'll rotate it the, uh, the opposite way. The two coils that we have wound. One of them is turned to the right, the other one is turned to the left. Okay. The reason for that is this puts out alternating current. And when you sit these up on your base, you're going to, to alternate. If they were all turned the same way, you'd be producing direct current, which is not what we want. We want alternating current. So you've got one left, this is a right, this is a left. <clears throat> Once you do these, you'll get you used to where you want to stop the tape. And I will show you that in the next step. I'm going to take these here that have been cleaned and <clears throat> wrap them. I've got four left there and four, four right here. What you do is just start with a length of half inch tape.
Now, this is where I talked about it's important that the tape that you laid on the ribbon be put against that mandrel. That will end up putting the tape on the inside of here. If you don't have that, when I wrap it with my half inch tape, the sharp edges of the ribbon will cut this tape. But with a piece of quarter inch tape inside, it overlaps it just enough to act as a cu cu cushion on there so that I can pull it just as tight as I can. If I did that without the tape on the inside, it would tear it. But you're going to pull this tight all the way around it like that. You're going to overlap this tape one half the width of it. It's easy to see because you can see the co copper right, right through it. For one field coil, we'll require two rolls of quarter inch tape and one roll of half inch tape, and that is 36 yards each roll. Kind of pricey, they run around eight and a half dollars for the one quarter inch rolls and about 1680 for the half inch roll. So you're going to have about 30 with your shipping and everything about $35 in tape for one. I put a little extra piece where the tab runs down for insulation. To clean 16 coils and put tape on them takes about two hours. To wrap, to wrap the 16 takes about another uh, hour and a half. So there's a lot of time invested. And then I always mark these as to whether they're right or left. This is a right hand. It's important that you do that. We'll do one more here with the left hand. Again, I'll put a little more tape under the tab.
once you get them sealed up like that and mark them again this is the left okay that's what you do with all your coils okay before we put the coils on the ring we have to put an insulator <clears throat> these I make out of gasket paper 30 thousandths thick um, you can just make a pattern off of an old coil and just cut them out what you want is to cover the entire co coil <clears throat> And they have to be under, there's two of them that'll be cut with a slot here to clear this. The reason they put these on is should, in the operation of the engine, a piece of metal or something get thrown in through the oil in behind these, <clears throat> that the coils will not ground to the base. I usually start at the pickup point <clears throat> and I start with a right hand one. Now, all the right hands will be the same if you'll notice how, th how these are. One of them will be di different because we're coming off the back side of it for the pickup. That's the one that you want to put right here. Okay. <clears throat> I use a block that is flat to start the drive and then the recessed part of it which fits right over the edge of it like that but will clear the pole like that and come around it. Then you go left. Sometimes they'll go on real hard because you put a little bit too much tape, but they'll go on there. why it's important when you make your arbor that it's the right size. Check as you're going through left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right. And when I wind these, I'm using a right hand on this side where it attaches to the mag post. That, that's not necessary that it be right hand, it can be left hand. What determines it is which coil did you run the tab off the back side? Because if you ran it off here, there would not be any way to put it in there. If you ran that coil here, you couldn't do it. It's got to come back around here to feed off the back side here. But for my purpose, I stay with the right hand there. That way I always do it the okay. same way. We've got a coil ring here that we've put all coils on it. <clears throat> and once we have them on that, we want to make a check. There's always a chance that if they were too tight, that you might have broke the tape loose as it was being, as it was being put down. To check for that, just take an ohmmeter, we'll hook it to ground, and what we're going to see is if we can pick up a current flow through any of the coils. If you do have current flow through any of them, that one has created a ground inside the hub. We're going to trim all the ends so that they can be connected. Take a, screw, take a screwdriver and force it down to the width of the coil, one fourth of an inch. Okay, 
once we have that. <clears throat> Take the lead from this coil, put it over the face of it. You can bend this one back, bend this one around. Cut them off like this. That's the connection. Okay, in this case here, this one will not reach. So we just make a crimp like this. We use pieces of it that we have. Another one that's short. We're going to bend the end of this one under the button. Just like that. Okay. Now you've got all the connections are made. We can start to so solder it. It's not necessary, but I do it anyway. I use a little bit of flux on all the connections. Sometimes oil from your hands or any impurities that were left on the co copper will not set the uh, solder right. When I do it, I will count the number of splices. I keep that in my head and then I know what I have to do. Okay, we're using the 6040 rosin core solder. Do not use acid core on this. And I use a piece of insulating paper like we used under this so that I can put them under it so no solder will drip down past it and cre create a bridge.
check it. Two splices in here. Okay. Now, we have the buttons, or the ground to do. It takes a little more heat on that. Okay, when we do this one here, since it takes so much heat, I like to take a screwdriver and try to break it. Get it right, up, right under the rib ribbon and see if it won't pull off. Let's just, just check for that. The last thing we do is the button on top. Just apply our heat to it. I want to put a little more on that. Now we're connected all the way. Make sure there's no loose solder anywhere. And we're gonna and we're gonna check for the current flow on these things, Matt. Make sure this thing works. You can use a battery charger if it's the old style with a heat switch in it, and an electronic one will not work, or just use a battery. Six volt or 12 volt will work. Okay. What we're gonna do, we're gonna take a steel scale and quickly check that you have a magnetic pole on each of them. Okay, the other thing is you want to make sure you got your left and right for alternating current. <clears throat> one will pull south pole, one will pull the north pole. So as we go around, it should switch. We got north, south, north, south, north. If you get two of them the same, you got it wrong. You've got one that's wound the opposite way and you'll have to take it loose. And of course all the ones after that will be loose until you get to the other one because there'll always be two of them there as well. But this way you know it's good. And this way you can check an older field coil also to check if it is any good. But are you gonna put an old field coil back in the engine? It's a long ways to get into it, and I have, I've had experience that I've had some that checked out very good, and because the person didn't want to spend any money, bought a used coil and put it in their engine, and for some reason it didn't work. Can't tell you why. Once we've got it checked, the final thing we do is to spur, spur, spray it. Yep. This varnish can come in a clear, or a red. Ordinarily I used a red. Seems like my source this time didn't have the red so we got the clear. But it'll work just as good. I just start on the side. To a certain extent the air pressure in this thing will Flow it inside, you know, in the, the base of it. But and I usually wait an hour, put another coat on for a total of three coats. And the final thing that you have to do, we need to remove all the bailed up off pole shoes so that you can adjust these for the right clearance. You can clean these off with a razor blade if you're very careful, but inadvertently at some point you'll, you'll dig into it and then you'll have to retape it 
or do damage. This is a whole lot easier, I think. We're not taking off any metal at all. You don't want to take anything off those pole shoes. You know, all, all, all you want to remove is the paint and the varnish. But that's what you got when you're done. So after the after the three coats, yeah. then we've got enough on here to seal these up, and and the, and the point of sealing that is to try to keep a lot of oil out of it or debris from getting in it. I mean, why is it? Why? I couldn't say it's to keep the oil out, although it does. The oil getting into it is not going to re to render it where it will not work, but. <clears throat> The way I see it, this is the top of the engine here, okay? When that engine is running and those magnets are in the oil, you're going to have the tendency for the oil to erode the, sur the surface. If you just had the bare tape on it, if uh, some debris got in the oil and went across it, tear the tape. Just the way to preserve any electrical motor or anything like that that you put together, we're going to put this stuff on it. Okay. Um, is, is there a. I get asked this a lot, and uh, basically I tell everybody for the cost of this, this is so far into the engine, it yes. requires so much work to change out that if you're rebuilding your engine, just buy a new field coil. Right, uh, you're you're probably time uh, way ahead. Now I know some of us, you know, might say, "Well, I've got this fairly decent looking field." Well, obviously the one you started on it was spaghetti, so you know it's bad. Right. And if you find some that are uh, the 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 tape is flicked off, I've heard of people trying to clean that off good enough and put some epoxy or something on it. And to me, I think that's just going to flip out. Well, but the, the whole idea that is, it, it, it's inaccessible unless you take the engine out. Right. Take transmit and ignition off. Okay, because of that, you want to have one that's good. If you're doing it for yourself, it's not too much work and you're saving yourself a lot of money. Right, right. Okay, so I got this used field coil, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to build my engine and put in this used field coil. As far as I'm concerned, that's a dumb move, okay? But you can take and hook up your battery, and you showed us how. You can't really take a, a, an ohm meter, continuity meter, because it's all of these coils are grounded it's a direct, out. Sure, yeah. It's a direct, It's a direct. So you can't read the resistance. So no. using the battery, if it's sucking it down, you can say, okay, this one pulled, this one pulled, the, the, the ruler pulls mm -hmm. down. What you don't know is how much debris has been shoved in the back of this thing. Could it be at the point where that piece of debris is just about to break into? Right. And now you've got a short. And you've got a short. Yes. You get around the section line once and the mag quits. Do you ever find an issue with the uh, cast iron? Only excessive corrosion in the bottom part. From the engine sitting with water right. or something like that in, in a that, long time. In that case, the pole shoes are going to be... If you have 60% of the surface left, I would be sure that's good. If you have... 80, 90 percent of it that's cratered, I probably would not use that. Go find another field coil. Right. 
Okay. And some that we've seen, I've seen pulled out of engines, something ripped my magnet or something really impacted the snot out of that coil. And it's like every, it's, it's just like taking a chisel almost right, and hitting right. it. They aren't broke, but they're just really crimpled up. Right. Are those ones that you, you use the technique to sta straighten up some of them little bumps? You can unroll it and you look at the damage. If it's a consistent damage every turn and it's not torn, yeah. Fix it. It can be straightened. But if it's torn, it's not worth to do it. You can, you can get another root. Where you're going to find most damage is where the starter go, go, goes in. A person that is unfamiliar with it, that is trying to pull the starter with a Bendix on it, of course, he's going to damage that co coil. Right, right. Okay. Setting up your air gap, what do you shoot for? They, they were saying 24. I think the um, book says uh, no closer than 20 and no further than 40. Right. So do you do you try to set up as close? Do you I think it pours? Do you think it pours out more the closer it is? Oh or? yes. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. It will because that is a that that is a component a component of it. Uh, you let your rear main wear. You're going to have more gap. It's going to be weak. Okay. Okay. Is there any other issues that a fellow would have to be aware of um, to, to rebuild one of these on his own? The tape, the tape, you did say the quarter inch tape is a special, you have to go to a... Well, you're not going to find a retailer that's going to have it cut to that head. So you go to a supplier, um, EIS is the one I use out of Oklahoma City, they're an electrical supply. And they have this tape on a large roll. And they have a machine that they will cut off the width that you want. Okay, okay. And I, I believe that's the better price for it because if you buy a, a, out of a retail store, you're gonna pay a lot more for it. Thank you so much for taking your time and Thank appreciate you. it. and. Uh, in closing, we'll have Claude's information up and he will be more than happy to take a phone call or and help you through the process. But again, I stress, he's not in business. So thank you, Claude. Appreciate it. Okay. Stay tuned to Model T Tips. Uh, we'll have some more good stuff coming out here, well, shortly, we hope. Talk to you soon. Thank you.